There's a lot of talk of brokenness in evangelical churches today. We're all broken people, they will tell us. And, and one pastor I used to listen to a lot would often say that the church is a slow motion train wreck or that it's a beautiful train wreck. Maybe you've heard pastors say similar things. Maybe you've heard them say that the church is like a hospital, that it's full of sick and broken sinners. But they tell you, remember, there's nothing to fear because Jesus died to remove the penalty of the sins that we've committed and that we continue to commit and that we just can't stop committing because of our debilitating brokenness. The wrath of God has been unconditionally removed because of Jesus' sacrifice. And now we can safely go through a very slow process of sanctification. It's like watching a plant grow. You often can't really see much change at all, but maybe in like 10 or 15 years, you'll be able to look back and see that some change has happened. There's a song we used to sing in some of the churches I used to be involved with by a band called Gunger. And the song is called Beautiful Things. And the first verse of the song starts like this. It says, all this pain. I wonder if I'll ever find my way. I wonder if my life could really change at all. Now it's one thing for an unbeliever, someone who has not been born again, to sing those words. But for Christians, born again believers, to, to be singing that in, in church services on a regular basis as though that's where they're still at? The, the second verse of the song is more hopeful. It suggests that change can happen in our lives. But the sense that I had was that mo most of us in our communities, we, we lived our lives in that first verse, wondering why we couldn't really see the kind of change in our lives that we wanted to see, why we didn't experience the kind of empowering grace that the New Testament talks about. And it was like, well, hey, we're, we're, we're just broken people. It's just the way it is, you know, but, but Jesus covered us with his blood. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that brokenness isn't a problem for humanity. Of course it is. But the emphasis that it's given in many churches today and the way it's talked about is misleading. And it's helping people, Christians, professing believers, to justify ongoing selfish patterns in, in their lives. Pastors often make it seem like it's normal for Christians to continue in this broken state. And, and they, they're conditioning their people to expect failure and ongoing spiritual mediocrity. And then it's like people, it's almost like people glory in their shame and their failure. And, and they say that it all just makes what Jesus did on the cross that much more wonderful and glorious because his sacrifice can save even someone as sinful as me. You know, and, and, and we just can't get it together. You know, we can't say no to certain sins, certain things that we just haven't been able to get out of our lives and leave behind for good. But hallelujah, you know, this is why the cross is so great. And it sounds a little bit like the people Paul talks about in Philippians 3, 18 and 19. Paul says, For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. A lot of Christians today think that they embrace the cross. They think that they are friends of the cross of Christ because they trust in what they think Jesus did on the cross, which covers over and forgives even their ongoing habitual sins. But in reality, they're actually enemies of the cross because they won't get on the cross with Jesus. They won't deny themselves and pick up and embrace their own cross and turn away from those sinful habits in their lives for good. So listen, don't, don't be tricked. Human beings may be broken in a way, but our primary problem is not brokenness. The primary problem is slavery. 
enslavement. The human race is under the influence of Satan and is enslaved to sin and selfish desires. That's the big issue. And Jesus died as a ransom and rose from the dead to free us and to break the spell that we've been under, the spell that many professing Christians are still under. Once you have come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who rose from the dead, and once you have given him your unconditional allegiance, you are no longer enslaved. That spell is broken. And therefore, there is no good reason or excuse to continue in any kind of premeditated, I know it's wrong, but I just can't say no kind of sin. Nor is there any excuse for spiritual laxity. These things are no longer inevitable like they were prior to conversion. I'm not saying that there's never a time when a true Christian struggles with some area. It's true, we're not perfect, and sanctification is a process. But a lot of Christians think that that sanctification process looks like pornography addiction that goes on and on for years or decades, or that it looks like divorcing and remarrying, or like just not being able or willing to give Jesus your whole life but continuing in this casual, lukewarm state for many years. And, you know, we'll get there someday. Someday we'll give Jesus our whole lives. But hey, sanctification is a slow process, right? It's like watching a plant grow. Actually, I think a better analogy than the plant analogy for sanctification is what happens to someone who's been eating junk food and watching TV on the couch for years and years, living a sedentary life, but who is then recruited for the TV show, Biggest Loser. This is where very overweight people lose lots of weight very quickly. All of a sudden, they're living a very different lifestyle, right? And, and they drop like 50 pounds in just a couple of weeks because they're so active and they're living such a different and, and radical lifestyle from what they were doing before. And then another 50 pounds drops off and then another 50 pounds all within just a few months. And then after they've dropped the majority of their excess weight and changed their lifestyle and gotten into a more healthy pattern, then they enter into a time where the weight loss slows down. And now it is more about making more precise diet changes. Maybe there are still some stubborn pockets of fat that don't go away so easily and which takes some special attention. But the binge eating, the junk food, the couch surfing, the, the, the binge watching, that's over. That is in the past. They've left that behind. It's gone, right? That's a better illustration for sanctification, I think. Fast, dramatic change up front in the beginning, and then a continued process of perfecting and honing and zeroing in on more subtle things that need to change. You become a Christian, and you immediately become obedient to the commandments of Jesus. And that produces radical change in your life real fast. The Sermon on the Mount alone turns your life upside down really quickly when you start to take it seriously. And then you're addressing more subtle issues, issues of motivation, issues of lingering selfish desires that may not control your life anymore, but which still tempt you, still bother you, still create an, an, an internal struggle, and these kinds of things. But many professing Christians today are still like the person who's binge eating junk food and living on the couch. They have not yet even become obedient to the commandments of Jesus in places like the Sermon on the Mount. And if they would, then they would see radical change very fast. And if they would simply embrace the reality that we have to follow Jesus and obey him if we want to enter his kingdom in the end, then many Christians would be ready and willing to deny themselves, pick up their cross in ways they haven't been able or willing to yet, and they would do whatever it takes to get their addictions out of their lives for good, and they would succeed in that. 
So I, I spent 15 years in various evangelical churches listening to this message that I'm so broken, but Jesus died to cover me. And, and then when I began just looking at what Jesus actually says and how the apostles think about all this, pow, my, my life changed more in just a few weeks than it had in a decade put together. Now, if you're an evangelical listening to this, I know what you may be thinking. And yes, the Corinthians had some big problems. Yes, some of them were doing some pretty awful things and Paul still affirmed that they were Christians. But were those things they were doing normal? Did Paul treat those things as though they were just a normal part of the sanctification process? Did Paul say, hey, we're all broken people, so I understand why these things are happening in your community, Corinthians. That's why Jesus died for you. Nothing to be concerned about. You can't out -sin God's grace. Is that what Paul said to them? No, it was more like, I'm warning you. Don't you realize that those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God? 1 Corinthians 6. Or, don't be like the Israelites who were saved out of Egypt to begin with, but then most of them perished in the wilderness because God was not pleased with them. 1 Corinthians 10. Or examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Don't you know that Christ is in you? Or have you failed the test? 2 Corinthians 13. Paul didn't say, you may be all messed up, Corinthians, but Jesus died for you, so don't be alarmed because his blood covers it or something like that. No, it was more like, hey, Corinthians, Jesus died for you. Therefore, this behavior is not acceptable or necessary. Leave it behind and strive forward with all your heart because you are in terrible danger right now. More like that. So don't be fooled into thinking that you're going to be this broken mess until you die, saved by grace alone. If there is any captivity to sin in your life, this is not normal. It may be common, especially today, for, for, for that to happen in the lives of professing Christians, but it's not normal, it's not healthy, it's not necessary if we really have been born again and have the Holy Spirit. Do not wait until God zaps you and takes the sin away. As Peter says in 2 Peter 1, God has already done everything that's necessary for us to be able to overcome and to live a godly life. And now he is waiting on you. The, the, the holdup is not with God. It's, it's always with us. You also might need to hear the true gospel. It's possible that you have only heard the Protestant gospel, which is impotent to produce the kind of life that only the true gospel can produce. So please read one of the gospels and then read the book of Acts and look closely at the preaching of Jesus and the apostles and what the message really is. And also please check out the video at the top of the screen, it should be, should be popping up on the screen sometime now, and let me know if you would like to talk. If you're in some kind of captivity to some kind of sin in your life, the Lord loves you and he is ready to bust you out whenever you're ready to take up that cross. As Jesus says in John 14, 15, and as Peter says in Acts chapter 5, God sends his Holy Spirit to those who obey him. And so as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, in light of God's promises, Let's purify ourselves from all that defiles us, inside and outside, and let's become completely holy in the fear of God.